Thank you. Well, I've been asked to start. So, first of all, uh, warmly welcome everyone. My name is Yasmin Sharif. I'm the director of Education Cannot Wait Global Fund hosted in the UN system at UNICEF. And it is my pleasure to welcoming you all today to this very important event. You know, as you all know, um, conflicts around the world today um, are severely impacting schools, uh, students, and educators, and school administrations through deliberate and indiscriminate, indiscriminate, indiscriminate uh, targeting and killing uh, and recruitment and rapes and abduction of students on their way to school, not the least girls on their way to school, or within the school premises. Uh, schools and universities that are meant to be that source for human evolution development are being targeted and bombed and destroyed to ashes. I mean, it's quite horrible when you think about it, but it is a horrible reality. Female students and teachers, they have been directly targeted for attack simply because of their gender, including the bombing and targeting of girls' schools, abduction, rape, and harassment, and armed parties at schools or along the roads. And today, five years since the critical tool, the same school declaration was established uh, to address and raise awareness and bring an end against this targeting, the Safe Schools Declaration was launched five years ago. Today, we will examine the latest data here about progress that is being made to prevent attacks and in mitigating the impact and ensuring accountability of the perpetrators. And what the Safe Schools Declaration does, it is to remind us there is an international legal framework in human rights law, international humanitarian law, and in refugee law that both safeguards the right to education and also the, the right to be protected. And the Safe School Declaration reminds us we better get back to where we started uh, in our global civilization of respecting international law. Before we start this session, um, I would like to allow me to mention a few general features to this uh, virtual event. First of all, it's being recorded and it's being, main, being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, participants, uh, video and audio has been disabled, so you can't use that. And please use menti.com to ask any question, and you will have the enter code, which is 974984, and which can be found on the screen. And if time permits, I will read select questions to the panel uh, after the interventions have been made. So with that, I will conclude my welcoming. Uh, and again, from the, on behalf of Education Cannot Wait, thank the Global Coalition um, for protecting uh, against attacks, for edu education for against attacks, for doing such an important work in, the, in, in today's world, where we never before had such a need to bridge and translate uh, law, international law, into reality for children and youth are suffering the brunt of conflict and displacement. Uh, I am honored to start by introducing Her Excellency um, Ms. Marianne Hagen, who is the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, who will provide opening remarks. This is important also as she takes the floor to underline Norway's role in spearheading the development of the Safe Schools Declaration together with Argentina. So one of the founders are now taking the floor. Over to you, Your Excellency, Ambassador and Vice Minister Marianne Hagen. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Few things are more important to protecting a child's well-being and future than going to school and feeling safe at school. Every child has a right to education. Unfortunately, in conflicts around the world, schools and universities are still 
targets of attack. This jeopardizes the safety and the learning of many girls and boys and young people. According to the upcoming Education Under Attack report, attacks on education have occurred in 93 countries over the last five years. This is simply unacceptable. The report also documents that schools and universities have been used for military purposes in more than 30 countries. This turns schools into targets for attacks, again endangering safety and learning. The Safe Schools Declaration is a response to this situation. Five years ago, 37 states endorsed the declaration at the conference here in Oslo. Our Minister of Foreign Affairs was a part of that process, then as Minister of Defense. Today, we urge all states to endorse and implement the declaration and its guidelines. I'm very pleased to see that the declaration and the guidelines have firmly established as the new standard for protecting children and education in conflict situations. More than half the UN member states, 104 to be exact, have now endorsed the declaration. The number of endorsements is encouraging, but it is implementation that is the most important. Around the world, the Safe Schools Declaration is protecting students and teachers alike. In Mali, the armed forces are incorporating the declaration and the guidelines into their military doctrines. In Afghanistan, military use of schools have declined significantly. In Nigeria, military teachers have been ordered to stop carrying weapons openly in schools. Nigeria has also spearheaded the declaration in the African Union. The declaration also provides a framework for sharing best practices and for working together to find ways to protect education in armed conflicts. Norway will help develop a network of experts to strengthen state-to-state -state cooperation for implementation of the declaration. And we welcome Spain's initiative to establish a technical coordination and training program focused on the application of the guidelines. If we are to succeed, we need strong partnerships. The Safe Schools Declaration was born out of a partnership between civil sector and the number of states led by Argentina and Norway. A core group of committed states has supported the declaration since day one. Several of them are co-sponsoring this event. The Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack continues to play a key part, not least through the Education Under Attack report. Thank you all. Together, we have achieved a lot, but there is still much more to do. We must continue to give priority to implementing the Safe Schools Declaration. Norway will be a consistent partner in these efforts because we know that by making schools safer, we are protecting our children and our common future. Thank you. Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi my dear. <laughs> so, Hi, I'm new uh, sorry, thank you, very, thank you very much, um, Your Excellency, I'm uh, Vice Minister Marianne Hagen. And I think the important point that you stressed and your great uh, examples of is implementation. We have to move from normative framework to an actual reality for implementation. Great examples. Thank you very much to Norway. Thank you very much to you, Vice Minister Hagen. Now I have the pleasure to introduce um, um, uh, Ms. Cristina Gallac, um, Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Spain, who will be speaking in, uh, in, in the of um, um, Her Excellency um, Ms. Arancha Gonzalez Laya, who is apologizing for running late to the meeting. Um, it's important here to highlight Spain's support and leadership in hosting the third international conference on safe schools that took place in Mallorca 
on the 27th, 29th of May last year. And I was there together with my colleague Zainab and I was absolute uh, inspirational event. Thank you, Spain. And now your excellency, uh, Christina Galak, Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear moderator, dear Yasmin. Yes, I have to apologize. Uh, my minister, Arancha Vontalaglaya, who is stuck in another meeting. These are days of meetings and telematic conferences, but she truly wanted to be with you. In any case, it's an honor for me to step on her just for for uh, a few minutes and to share some of your thoughts. I should also add that I am super pleased to see so many friends uh, I have had uh, during my times at the UN, to all of you ambassadors, very senior officials, USGs, my, uh, my uh, congratulations for the work you have been doing during these terribly difficult moments of COVID. So um, let me go to the, to the matter of the point that is gathering us today. Um, we are very grateful for being invited to participate in this event that marks the fifth anniversary of the Safe School Declaration. We are in the midst of exceptional times, a global crisis that overlaps with other policy challenges like the protection of the most vulnerable in armed conflicts, especially educational institutions. Millions of students are forced to abandon the schools in order to prevent the spread of violence. Millions follow the schooling programs with great difficulties. However, this crisis reminds uh, us on three important lessons. One, that we are deeply interconnected one with the other. Two, that prevention works. And three, that international cooperation is key to overcome the common challenges. I will try to explain the, them briefly. Since 2015, we can proudly attest that the Save the Schools Declaration is working effectively and it saves lives and preserves the right to education for all, even in the hardest circumstances, including women and girls. It means that prevention is working here. Now, let me briefly touch on the international cooperation point. The third international conference on safe schools that Spain proudly hosted in Palma de Mallorca one year ago. And I was very proud to be there and to join many of you. At that time, I could hug, we could hug each other, which is not the case, but it will come back to those moments. So the, the conference in Palma de Mallorca showed how important it is to stimulate international cooperation to galvanize the support to this policy challenge. The declaration has been now endorsed by a growing number of uh, member states, when UN member states and organizations, and we hope that this marks a clear and progressive step towards universalization. Secondly, the gender approach is fundamental to both, to define the problem and search for concrete solutions. The Spanish government is certain that a gender responsive approach is key for this and many other issues. So we are pushing this agenda steadily forward. I'm proud to say, as my minister says, we are fully engaged in a feminist foreign policy. Thirdly, the emphasis on the fight against impunity and the need to bring to justice the perpetrators of these attacks, it is, it is, this is the best way to counter and avoid them. Nevertheless, reports shows that even if 
the number of attacks is decreasing. The military use of schools, the military use of schools is increasing. Plus, COVID-19 has forced many children to abandon schools. Therefore, there is no room for complacency. Spain remains committed to continue walking our talk through concrete steps. As uh, Marianne has mentioned, there are very good examples of that. We are reinforcing our humanitarian diplomacy actions and working at different levels involving our Ministry of Defense and others to continue to advocate for the protection of schools and universities in armed conflicts and humanitarian settings. As announced in Mallorca, we are organizing together uh, with Global Coalition, an active training program with a group of signatories focused on the application of the guidelines and their integration into regulatory and operational frameworks. The current crisis has obliged us to reschedule to December but, or to January next year the events, but we are determined to organize them. And let me conclude by commending publicly the work of Global Coalition to protect education from attack and the comprehensive report Education Under Attack 2020. Prevention, advocacy, visibility, and accountability are fundamental pillars for this endeavor. And I congratulate all of you for the work done. Let me also, uh, before I conclude, to recognize the commitment of Norway, of Argentina, of Qatar, who have successfully facilitated the draft resolution, International Day to Protect Education from attack that the Spain proudly co-sponsored. Let me also thank UNICEF and the office of my dear Virginia Gamba for their commitment and hard work, international NGOs, local actors, and civil society, along with the states that are playing a critical role your support and trust are key to succeed and protect education. Let us continue this great work together to call for an even broader member of states to endorse the declaration, to prevent attacks with a strong advocacy, to make visible all the attacks in the schools, to condemn them, and to bring perpetrators to justice. This is a noble and necessary cause and an ethical, a strategical fight. Thank you all very much for inviting us here and let's continue the good work started. Over to you, dear moderator. Um, thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister Yalak, for your for your intervention and your emphasis on gender justice, not to forget that girls are often the target as a means of warfare, and um, the emphasis on addressing impunity. We need to bring the perpetrators uh, to um, accountability in order to end it. I now have the pleasure of um, inviting Dr. Marika Solakis and Dr. Jerome Marston who are the lead researchers and researchers respectively at the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attacks. Um, as you know, um, the coalition uh, is composed of UN agencies and NGOs that have been working for the last 10 years to protect education from targeted and discriminate attacks by armed and forced groups. Now, GCPA, the coalition, will soon release, and the report has been mentioned already, its flagship report, Education Under Attack 2020, which is a global study of attacks on schools, universities, their students, staff, armed by, uh, armed, by armed forces and armed groups. And um, the importance is that it will prevent, it will present the data and the research and the conclusions 
that will eventually lead to uh, accountability and, and for which also if education cannot wait, uh, is making investments in support. Now, the first report, report uh, uh, for the, on the Education Under Attack report was first published by UNESCO in 2007 and then in 2010. And then it was published by the coalition itself in 2014 and 2018. And as, as I mentioned, the data from the report serves as the primary source for reporting on indicator 4A. Point three on attacks committed against students, educational personnel, educational institutions, uh, and uh, which monitor progress on implementing SDG 4, which is quality education. Now, what will be interesting to listen to our colleagues from the coalition is, and I will invite them here now to describe the scope of the attacks on education, the military use of schools around the world, and any trends that you have identified in your research and that will be presented in the report. So I hand over to you, um, Dr. Marika and Dr. Jerome. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Before we answer your question, we wish to thank the Norwegian, Spanish, Argentine, Qatari, Nigerian, and Uruguayan missions for co-hosting this event. We would also like to acknowledge Education Cannot Wait, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Education Above All Foundation, and an anonymous donor who have all generously contributed to Education Under Attack 2020. And finally, thank you to everyone who is joining us virtually today. We are thrilled to share some data on the scope and impact of attacks on education from our upcoming report. Education Under Attack 2020, as you mentioned, monitors the threatened or actual use of force against students, teachers, schools, or universities, as well as the military use of educational facilities between 2017 and 2019. These attacks have both acute and lasting impacts on survivors, families, and communities, as well as on entire education systems. GCPIA is the most comprehensive source of data on attacks on education globally. As a coalition, we are uniquely positioned to compile evidence from the UN, NGO, media, and partners in the field. Today's presentation will highlight some preliminary analyses of this data on both national and global levels. Overall, our data shows that attacks on education have slightly decreased over the past five years. This is good news to celebrate today as we discuss progress on protecting schools and universities in, situation, in situations of armed conflict and insecurity. However, GCPA remains very concerned about the alarming number of attacks on education globally. In fact, we have found that attacks are occurring in more countries around the world and intensifying in certain areas. In the past five years, we identified at least 90 countries which had experienced one or more reported attack on education. This is an increase of 20 countries since the last report was published two years ago. This animation shows where attacks are increasing and decreasing in the 37 countries profiled in the upcoming report. 10 countries will be profiled for the first time. GCPF found that attacks on schools remain the most common violation, making up over two thirds of all reported attacks on education. These included arson, explosives, and gunfire, both collateral and targeted. Our data shows that the Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan were the most affected by attacks on schools. In the latter three countries, the use of explosive weapons was particularly devastating during this period. In Syria, we found that 90% of all reported attacks on schools in 2018 and 2019 involved explosive weapons, most of which were airstrikes. In other cases, students, teachers, and school staff themselves become targets. These direct attacks harmed thousands globally over the past five years. Cameroon was one of the countries most affected by this violation. During this reporting period, GCPA found that at least 700 school students and teachers were abducted, killed, 
threatened or arrested in Cameroon, though this number is likely to be much higher. In one particularly chilling example from February 2019, armed separatists abducted over 170 students and two personnel from a secondary school in Northwest Cameroon. The school shut its doors following the attack, affecting the education of hundreds. Similarly, university students, professors, and facilities also came under attack in 36 countries profiled in the upcoming report, and in many others across the world. In the following presentation, Zahir will expand on their repercussions. GCP's research has found that attacks on education particularly impact women and girls. Specifically, we identified 21 countries where targeted attacks on women and girls occurred over the past five years. In some cases, armed groups use violence to stop girls from pursuing an education, such as in Pakistan, where the UN verified that armed actors damaged 14 girls' schools in a single night in 2018. In DRC and Nigeria, GCP have found that during and after attacks on schools, female students were particularly vulnerable to abduction, recruitment, and sexual violence. Next, we identified 34 countries where armed groups or armed forces used schools and universities for military purposes such as for barracks, weapon stores, or to detain prisoners between 2015 and 2019. The presence of armed parties can lead to the partial or complete closure of a school for weeks, months, or even years, as well as elevate the risk of child recruitment and sexual violence. Not just the school is affected, but the tens or hundreds of students that attend that school have their learning impacted by military use, such as we found in Taiz Governorate, Yemen, where armed parties used at least 23 schools between 2015 and 2017, impacting the education of up to 13,500 students, nearly half of whom were girls. Military use is not inevitable, however. As we all know, it can be avoided. In fact, military use is prohibited for UN peacekeepers, and GCP has not identified any new cases of military use by these forces since early 2017. To end attacks on education, GCP's overarching recommendation is that states and stakeholders endorse and implement the Safe Schools Declaration. Specifically, GCP urges states and stakeholders to first, restrict military use, including by incorporating the guidelines for protecting schools and universities into military training and doctrine. Second, ensure accountability for perpetrators of attacks on education. Third, develop safety and security plans to prevent and respond to attacks on education and that take into account the specific needs of women and girls. Finally, strengthen monitoring and reporting of attacks on education, including by disaggregating data by type of attack, level of schooling, and gender. Thank you, Yasmin, for the introduction. And thank you to the audience and our fellow speakers for listening to Marika's and my presentation. Yasmin, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Stulakis and Dr. Marston. And um, we certainly look forward very much uh, to read the report and, and also um, to express great respect to the, to the important research that you do. Without evidence and data, this would not have been possible. And uh, very interesting and telling uh, presentation. Thank you. We now move on to um, uh, 
a colleague among ours um, who actually was there uh, when it happened um, uh, and has seen it firsthand. Uh, Mohammed Sahar El Bakur is a PhD candidate in, in biomedical science at Aberdeen University. Now, Sahar, you were a lecturer at the University of Aleppo in Syria when your university campus came under attack. Please tell us very short and briefly, but also profoundly shaking us, what was the experience? What did you see? What did you have to go through? Over to you, Sahar. I thank you very much. Can everyone hear me, please? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will just share. I will just share my very short presentation. I promise it will be short. And thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me for this amazing uh, event. I will just share my presentation. Uh, okay. Here we go. A quick and uh, hopefully. Hopefully, all, all what you have mentioned about targeting schools and universities will be will be addressed in this presentation. And and every time I start speaking about it, I try to come up with a different title for the presentation. But it always I get stuck back that you are the hope where no hope exists. And and that is actually actually that like compiles my whole story. So this is basically I grew up in Aleppo in Syria, and this is Aleppo in 2010. It was a lovely city and it was a lovely country. And we had a lovely life there, and I still remember every single moment of it. The photo in the middle of in the middle of this presentation particularly means a lot to me because these are my university friends. And what's unique about this photo is that this photo can't be taken anymore because every one of them is now in a different country. And what, why is that for? Because 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 the war actually started in 2011, and this is our city and our country in 2011 which was at some point the most dangerous city in the world, and I was there. And fighting in Syria never discriminated between schools, buildings, universities, or even hospitals. I still remember spending nights and days hiding in our building, in our house, and wishing that everything is going to be fine while hearing people out fighting outside, like in this photo. So to give you a sense of what it means, I would ask, I would like to ask everyone just to close their eyes and imagine that there is a fight happening outside. And what you will hear is this. Thank you. So that is that is just like 10 seconds of what you what I spend nights and days just hearing and wishing that everything will be fine outside. Well, every country that goes under war suffers from, from shortage of all resources, such as water, food, and everything. And I still remember queuing with these people just to get some water for me and my family. And even going to universities wasn't, wasn't that easy. Uh, I remember one day we were having an exam and out of a sudden an explosion happened and uh, so close to our building and our building started shaking and we vanished under our desks. The exam wasn't suspended. We were given only 10 minutes extra. That's, that, that's all. And that's the picture over there. The explosion happened while we were doing the exam. I still also remember running with these people in this photo to avoid snipers' shoots. No, one, no words can describe your feelings, especially when I had to run, carrying my sister's daughters and covering her with only my body to protect her from sniper's shoots. Even, even our memories were even destroyed. This photo was taken from my primary school. And as you can see, this is in, 2000, in 2014, and it turned into a fighting point, and fighters just hide into the uh, school buildings. I successfully, I managed to graduate and get, to get hired with the University of Aleppo and uh, I got another position with the Shifa Pharmaceutical Industries. That was, that was good news. And however, however, by doing so, you are risking your life and anything could happen at any point. And this is, for example, uh, the destruction after, after explosion happened in our, in our this picture. It's, from, from the pharmaceutical company, which was targeted a few times. I used to work in the, middle, in the middle building in the picture, and I was lucky I wasn't there when this happened. However, I still remember when we had to hide in the ground floor 
And, and I would also ask you again to close your eyes and imagine missiles are being dropped by air forces. And this is what you will hear again. That is something we were used to live, and this is something we will never, ever forget. However, after 600 emails and applications all around the world, only one reply came from the UK, from the Council for Atlas Academics and the University of Aberdeen, who in 2016 offered me a full scholarship to study my master's and my PhD. And since that point, my life now is completely different. You can see in the pictures that every different day is every day is different from attending workshops, presenting seminars and posters, contributing to public engagement events, and even winning prizes. However, I still remember that every day could have also been different. I could have been forced to fight with these forces, uh, with, the, with, with the military forces, or to escape that. I could have been escaping with these people from ex place of explosion to another seeking a safe place. And the only last option, the safe option would be ending my life in refugee camps. And we all know the pain that people constantly suffer in these camp, 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 campuses. However, sometimes you feel you may, you, may, you may want to take that challenge and keep your life like that for the rest of your life. However, what matters the most now is my baby is growing in a safe place. And hopefully, she will have a better life and memories than mine. And finally, what I would address, and I hopefully I should have I, I have addressed that protecting education, schools and universities in any way could change someone's life from being in a full of risk and danger to safe to a safe life that is full of achievements and success. So I would also say thank you very much. Thanks to the moon and back. And I will hand back to you. Yes, thank you. OK. Um... Am I on? Yes, I'm on, right? Yes, I'm on. Okay, shukran, shukran Katira, Ya Muhammad. That was very nice, um, and it was also very sad, but it's good to see a happy ending for you personally, but it's also a reminder of what the realities are like out there. Thank you so much. We are now turning to a great advocate for, um, to uh, a great advocate to end armed violence um, and, and children again and violence against children in armed conflict. Uh, and that is our distinguished uh, special representative of the Secretary General, Miss Virginia Gamba, uh, who has uh, her office spearheads monitoring and reporting on attacks on school and personnel and collects data and on, of military and on military use of schools. And in addition, her office dialogues with the perpetrators to end the violation. Now, what progress have you seen in preventing uh, the attacks on education and deterring the military use of, of, uh, of schools and, and the violations committed uh, during your time in, in post uh, and the great, under the great leadership of what you're doing? I hand over to you, SISG Agamba. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with all of you today. Attacks on schools and protected personnel is one of the six grave violations that my office monitors and reports on. We work very closely with the field through the country task forces on monitoring and reporting, which we call the CTFMRs. And we do this in 19 situations of conflict around the world. My office supports the CTFMRs and works to improve monitoring and reporting of all violations as well, and this is the important bit, to strive to engage with all parties to conflict so that we can stop and prevent the violations. We also support the city of MRs in the field by advocating with perpetrators to cease the violations, such as attacks on schools, and adopt measures to better protect children, such as preventing the military use of schools. Last year, 
Schools continue to be looted, damaged, and destroyed during military operations or during attacks on villages. Teachers were threatened and killed by state and armed groups because of their work. Boys, but mostly girls, were targeted for pursuing the right to education. Ethnic minorities or indigenous communities also saw their teachers and pupils threatened, attacked, or killed. For instance, the education infrastructure in Syria was massively impacted by hostilities. While in Afghanistan, hundreds of schools used as election polling stations in the country became targets and suffered devastating attacks. In Somalia, the targeting of schools and education by extremely violent groups led to massive exodus of families seeking protection for their children's right to education. And we are seeing, with a lot of concern, a similar pattern now emerging in several countries in the Sahel region, where education is indeed under attack. However, in other cases, 2019 also brought progress as a result of action plans and dialogue with parties to conflict. For instance, last year, armed forces and groups that use schools for military purposes in the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, South Sudan, and Sudan vacated schools after advocacy by both the United Nations and local communities. In the DRC and in Sudan, there has been greater awareness about the military use of schools, resulting in greater prevention and lower numbers of use by state forces. In South Sudan, the recent adoption by all parties to conflict of a revised action plan covering the six grave violations against children with specific provisions to end and prevent attacks on schools, as well as the non-military use of schools, is really starting to be implemented to good effect. And in the Central African Republic, two armed groups adopted action plans, which include similar provisions. Therefore, we can say that dialogue and engagement with parties to conflict does make a difference in preventing attacks on education and in deterring the military use of schools. As we mark the fifth anniversary of the Safe Schools Declaration, I will continue my advocacy for more governments to join and implement its guidelines as a prevention measure against the military use of schools. However, I also call your attention to the potential negative impact of COVID-19 in relation to the protection of education and the non-military use of schools. As schools are vacated, they can become easy targets for military occupation by armed forces and groups. It is therefore fundamental that we support the global ceasefire call made by the United Nations Secretary General on the 23rd of March and remind all parties to conflict that education, even when schools are closed, must continue to be protected. I welcome that parties in the Central African Republic, Colombia, the Philippines, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, among others, have already declared ceasefires following this appeal. As countries around the world are focusing on the response to COVID-19, and as indicated by the Secretary General on his special initiative to minimize the impact of the pandemic on the young, we need to stand ready to respond to the urgent education needs of children, particularly in conflict-affected regions. Schools should always be safe havens for children. We must remind the world that children have a right to continue to learn unimpeded, even in times of war and even in times of pandemics. The Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack is a wonderful vehicle to carry this message through. And my office will continue to support your good efforts. So thank you very much for this. Um, uh, SRSG Gambia for, for a very interesting presentation. I think there were two very uh, interesting points 
One is how one can negotiate and, and, and actually persuade and advocate with armed groups on the ground, such as the, the two armed group, groups in Central African Republic uh, or in, in South Sudan, where schools have been vacated and no longer host uh, military or weaponry. And, and, and that is an important work done at the field level, but also the call from the UN Secretary General to, to enforce and respect the ceasefire um, as, that has come uh, during COVID-19, because that's also the global change that we need. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, it's, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Bruno Stagno Ugarte who is the Deputy Executive Director for Advocacy at Human Rights Watch. And prior to that, he was also Foreign Minister for Costa Rica. Um, Human Rights Watch, as we know, has played a critical role in monitoring attacks on education and advocating for accountability. And other accountability for education-related violation. This is very firmly embedded in the Safe Schools Declaration. So our question uh, to you, um, uh, Bruno, is how can we increase investigation and strengthen investigation of attacks on education and prosecution of the perpetrators? And, and what progress have you seen in establishing accountability? So I hand over uh, to you, uh, Mr. Bruno um, Steino of Human Rights Watch, please. Thank you, Yasmin, and it's great to be with all of you. Uh, without accountability for attacks on education, we will never be able to achieve our goal of safe education and safe schools for all. Ensuring accountability must begin at the national level with proper trainings and enforcement by armed forces and when necessary by governments through their domestic justice systems. Very occasionally, we do see domestic trials of perpetrators of crimes against education. Last July, a court in Kenya convicted three people for the Al-Shabaab attack on Garissa University College in 2015. While investigating armed Islamic group attacks in Burkina Faso, we at Human Rights Watch came across one effort to put a perpetrator responsible for an attack on a teacher on trial. But these rare cases of accountability are mostly against non-state perpetrators, not against state actors. We must therefore do much more to encourage domestic prosecutions against all perpetrators, regardless of whether they are government security forces, multinational coalitions, non-state armed groups, or even United Nations peacekeepers. And we would hope that the Safe Schools Declaration might provide a vehicle for providing encouragement, cooperation, and support. Domestic accountability, however, requires that there are rules and laws in place that we can enforce. One recent positive development is the adoption by the Philippines of arguably the world's first law to criminalize the occupation of schools for military purposes during armed conflict. Building on this development, we hope that the Philippines will soon endorse the Safe Schools Declaration so that it can share its efforts with the Safe Schools community. And in what might soon be another example of progress, we understand that Nigeria is currently considering a legal amendment that would also ban the requisitioning of schools for military purposes. However, national jurisdictions may be unable and at times unwilling to prosecute crimes against education. So we also need to envisage and encourage international avenues and venues for accountability. Various international investigations are taking a specific interest in the impact of armed conflict on education. And I can cite, for example, the work being done by the group of eminent experts on Yemen, the Commission of Inquiry on Syria. But there are also opportunities, for example, for the International Criminal Court, as well as for the international impartial independent mechanisms that have been created for Myanmar and Syria. Such dedicated attention is warranted, and we hope that international scrutiny of and accountability for crimes against education will continue. We eagerly await the United Nations Secretary General's annual report on children in armed conflict and its annexes, which have proven their ability to influence warring parties' behavior for the better and to promote accountability. However, the integrity of the report and its contribution to accountability are seriously undermined when political carve-outs allow persistent perpetrators, like Saudi Arabia, to either not be listed or mentioned as registering progress, notwithstanding responsibility for an overwhelming majority of UN-verified attacks on schools. As a member of the Watchlist for Children in Armed Conflict, 
we at Human Rights Watch continue to advocate that all perpetrators must be held to the same standards in this report. And we therefore hope that Burkina Faso, Cameroon and Ukraine, where we have seen many schools come under attack, will appear in the Secretary General's report this year. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much, uh, Bruno. This was a, a great reminder that what we need is um, rule, rule of law rather than rule by force and to maintain the imperative of equality um, and uh, impartiality and justice. Everyone hold to the same, held accountable to the same standards. Very important messages. Thank you very much for that. And now we will move on to the, to the next phase of this event. And I have the honor to introduce the co-sponsors of this event. And then um, they will say, uh, make a short intervention. And I will start with His Excellency, Her Excellency, Ms. Alia Ahmed Saif Al Thani. Uh, from the permanent mission of the state of Qatar to the United Nations. Please, uh, Your Excellency, Madam Ambassador, if you want. Thank you so much, uh, Yasmin. Can you hear me? Now we hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for giving me the floor. and. Let me begin uh, by saying how thankful I am to, to Zahar ba Al Bakur from Syria for his very much eye, you know, eye opening statement early on. I think he, it's a reminder for all of us why are we spending this time and energy in, in pursuing this agenda? You know, we need to continue the work we're doing to protect children in, during armed conflict. We need to continue safeguarding their right to, to education. So thanks to him and to all of those colleagues who are pursuing this agenda. Qatar is very much pleased, of course, and honored to co-sponsor uh, the event today together with Norway, uh, Argentina, Nigeria, Spain, Uruguay, and the Global Coalition on Protection of Education from Attack. This event uh, for us couldn't have come at a more opportune time as we, of course, embark the fifth anniversary of the Safe Schools Declaration I'm extremely pleased and proud that Qatar has led the effort, to, of course, to, to presenting a timely resolution that I wanted to, to bring to your attention, Resolution A-74-L66, slash slash entitled the International Day to Protect Education from Attack. Of course, this uh, resolution is now under consideration by the General Assembly, and hopefully in, hopefully in a couple of hours, we will be able to adopt it by consensus. We are very thankful to all of the 62 countries who have co-sponsored so far the draft resolution and we're thankful for their constructive engagement throughout the process. But this draft resolution, of course, is an important reflection of the urgent need to safeguard schools as places of protection and safety for students and educators and to keep education at the top of the public agenda. We have worked together in these very difficult and challenging times to demonstrate our unwavering political commitment to end attacks on education facilities and, and to ensure access to education for those most vulnerable to such attacks. And, and of course, uh, we are working together in a spirit of unity and solidarity with uh, the 75 million school age children living in 35 crisis affected countries who are in the most desperate need of education, educational support. Once adopted, of course, this draft resolution provides us with a globally shared date for all humanity to recommit to end attacks on education and, uh, and uh, to the military use of schools. It provides an opportunity for students around the world to remember and uh, remember their brothers and sisters every September 9th, every year in these vulnerable situations. Um, I want to take the opportunity today to, to uh, you know, to continue to call on those colleagues who have not yet co-sponsored to do so. We still have the chance to do it. I'm sorry to prolong, and thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you very much. That was an excellent intervention and a reminder. We look forward to the resolution. May it be adopted. Thank you. And then we move on to our next co-sponsor, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador Carlos Amorin of the Permanent Mission of Uruguay. Please. Thank you very much. Can you hear it? 
Well, when I try to be as quick as possible, uh, when we acknowledge the compelling uh, information on education attacks and the response we have, we experience really uh, mixed feelings. On one side, we are deeply worried by the growing number of, of attacks on education, attacks on schools and other education institutions, the use for uh, military purposes, perpetration of terrible acts of violence and threats, threats against students and teachers. Particular concern is the situation of children who can be recruited and deprived from the basic rights to education. Women and girls are also extremely vulnerable to suffer sexual violence and abduction during attacks on school. However, on the other hand, it is encouraging to know that the goals results, the good results have been obtained, and that many people are making hard and tireless efforts towards the protection of, of the education against attacks. In this sense, the mem we member states should also assume the, our responsibilities, but there is still a long way to go. I would like to, to refer briefly to two specific actions that should be undertaken. First, it is crucial to endorse and implement the Safe School Declaration, which will require strongly support. The declaration offers concrete steps to protect education from attacks while defending the right to the education. Uruguay is taking, taking proactive steps toward implementation. As an example, in the training programs provided to the Uruguayan troops that participate in peacekeeping operation, the respect for education and the school is duly taken into account. We would like to take this opportunity to encourage the member states that have not yet done so to endorse the declaration. Secondly, accountability of those responsible, responsible for per, uh, perpetrating attack, attacks against education is essential both to seek justice and to prevent future violations. But they conduct full and impartial investigation, but sorry, but to conduct full and impartial investigation and punish perpetrators, it is critical. First, to collect reliable information. In this regard, the report education and their attack service as an inv invaluable source of data and information on incidents of attack and education. We would like to thank the coalition for providing us this useful tool, and we welcome this fifth edition that will be launched next month. The global, global health crisis caused by COVID-19 is teaching us a new lesson. A school not only provides education, they are also safe space, mainly when security cannot be provided by families and communities. Know that many schools are closed as a result of the pandemic. Many children and women are exposed to different forms of violence. Therefore, we need to renew our efforts to protect education from attacks. This is more imperative than ever. Schools have an important role to play to teach students how to protect themselves and, and the others, to provide information and knowledge about the disease and to teach, teach tolerance, non-discrimination and solidarity in this unpredictable and difficult times. And also, I, finally, I join also the, uh, the remarks made by the, our distinguished colleague of Qatar in order to ask everybody to join the resolution that hopefully we are going to adopt today. We are in board, just to clarify, but with very, we attach a very important place to this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ambassador of the Permanent Mission of Uruguay. Uh, and I realized, as you were speaking, that I did forget our also honorable guest, um, Ambassador uh, Alejandro Guillermo Verdier of Argentina, to take the floor. 
Um, but at least we started off in South America and we'll continue with South America. So uh, let me introduce His Excellency, uh, Mr. Guillermo Verdier of the permanent mission of Argentina to the United Nations. So please take the floor and my sincere apologies. Over to you. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, Vice Minister, uh, Ms. Gamba, colleagues and friends. Firstly, I'd like to thank all the co-hosts of this event, Norway, Nigeria, Qatar, Spain, and Uruguay, as well as the Global Coalition to Protection Education from Attack. When in 2005, Argentina and Norway led the consultations to develop the Safe School Declaration, little did we know that five years later, it would have had so much impact. The data shared today with the panelists show the concrete effects that the endorsement of the declaration has for the everyday lives of the people who live in those 104 countries. States must fulfill their obligations to ensuring access to education even in every difficult situation, even in conflict given that education is not only a human right, but an essential protection mechanism for children, helping them to reach their potential and contribute to building stronger, more resilient, and more peaceful communities. Continued access to safe education can help protect children and youth from the worst impact of armed conflicts and can also help to prevent the emergence of new ones. Additionally, protecting the education sector as much as possible from the effects of war can help the recovery of a country in the post-conflict phase. Up to date, the relevance of the Safe School Declaration has been acknowledged not only by member states and NGOs, but also by the Secretary General and the Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict, Ms. Gamba, here present today. The Safe Schools Declaration and the guidelines for protecting schools and universities from military use during armed conflict are practical tools that help us guarantee the right to education, even though we are happy that 104 states have endorsed the declaration, I think it is important for us to think about joint strategies to move towards a universal endorsement of the Safe Schools Declaration. Before concluding, let me thank all the previous speakers, and uh, uh, I've been very shocked to witness um, the presentation by, by our Syrian uh, friend. Really very touching. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for staying with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, for, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the permanent mission of Argentina to the United Nations. And, and thank you also for highlighting that education is both a human right, but it's also an essential protection mechanism. And, and, and for the 75 million children, as, as our, our dear friend of Qatar mentioned, in conflict and uh, in armed conflict and crisis. We shall now move on um, to the next uh, co sponsor, His Excellency Mr. Samson Sande Itegboya uh, of the permanent mission of Nigeria to the United Nations. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, moderator, excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, as we commemorate the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the Safe Schools Declaration, let me begin by saying how pleased Nigeria is to be a part of this important event alongside the other eminent co-hosts. We thank all the speakers before us and would like to commend the Global Coalition to protect education from attack, GCPA, for being an invaluable trove of resources 
in our collective and noble task of protecting education from attack. Today, they have presented us with the salient point contained in their 2020 report to be released soon. Excellencies, Nigeria holds the view that quality education for all is the cornerstone of a holistic development and contributes exponentially to promotion and protection of human rights, poverty eradication, improvement of health outcomes, promotion of gender equality, environmental sustainability, building peaceful and resilient societies, and indeed, the realization of the SDGs of which quality education itself is a part. It was in view of this that Nigeria, with the support of member states, including the co-hosts of this event, introduced and sought to the consensual adoption of General Assembly Resolution 73 slash 25, declaring 24th January as International Day of Education in order to annually and globally celebrate the immeasurable importance of education. Excellencies, the world cannot successfully analyze the value of education if it is under attack. Yet, sadly, education continues to come under attacks from different sources and for different reasons, some of which are ideological, structural, climate change induced, as well as conflict related. It is important to quickly note that attacks on schools in Nigeria have been majorly carried out by Boko Haram insurgents, whose ideology is diametrically opposed to Western education. On this call, I thank the state of Qatar for shepherding us through the adoption of General Assembly Resolution on International Day for protecting education from attack. I need to say too that we are a co-sponsor of that resolution. Nigeria has not only endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration by which it committed to implementing the guidelines for protecting schools and universities from military use during armed conflict, it has followed it up by launching the Safe Schools Initiative aimed at providing education and piloting safe education facilities in the conflict affected areas of the Northeast. Like you have heard from other speakers, Nigeria spearheaded the Safe Schools Declaration at the African Union. Very importantly, I should like to stress that the government of Nigeria remains resolute in ensuring that our children stay in schools by protecting education from attack and providing safe and conducive environment for learning. Indeed, as part of the expression of his belief that education must continue for his children, even in emergency situations, the Federal Ministry of Education of Nigeria developed an education in emergency curriculum. This curriculum not only aims at realizing the right of every Nigerian child to education, but also aims to ensure that children study in emergency situations can be mainstreamed into the former school system when their condition normalizes. Having saved the best for the last, it is my singular honor and privilege to announce that the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has accepted to host the fourth international conference on safe schools next year, 2021. As I speak, arrangements are being put in place to ensure that the event will be a great success. Let me therefore seize this opportunity to invite one and all to Nigeria to participate in the fourth international conference on safe schools in the spirit of the collaborative and concerted efforts needed to protect education from attack. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, um, 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 Ambassador um, Sundai Itego of the Permanent Mission of Nigeria, and wonderful news that the fourth international conference on the Safe Schools Declaration will be in Nigeria. Congratulations. Congratulations. Then we move on. Before we open the floor for Malay Hamalik from Education Above All, who is a key partner of the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attacks, um, and she, um, she would like to say a few words. So 
Uh, my dear sister, Malaya Malik from Education Above All, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I just want to thank all the um, organizers and take the opportunity to say how marvelous it is that Nigeria is going to be hosting the conference and thank the ambassador um, for, for that information. On the fifth anniversary of the Safe Schools Declaration, this is an opportunity truly to acknowledge the uh, legal instrument as a unique and innovative tool for, for normative global governance of this extremely pernicious issue of attacks on education, which as the data has revealed is, is very, very far um, for, from um, being resolved. And I think the key thing about the Safe Schools Declaration, for those of us who've examined it closely, is it's, a, it's the balance between its potential to ensure accountability, normative regulation, but also monitoring and reporting, which I think has been underused within, within the legal instrument itself. And I think through consistent advocacy, leadership by states such as um, uh, Nigeria hosting the conference and providing leadership within the African continent and efforts of civil society organizations such as ours working in collaboration with GCP and our partners. I think that in a short span of five years, we've seen an absolutely remarkable level uh, of achievement. But I think that we need to keep on looking forward. We need to remain visionary. We need to be ambitious. I think there's aspects of the Safe Schools Declaration where more work needs to be done. I think that one of those areas is to do more work on uh, refining concepts, on disaggregation of data, and giving due proportionate weight to the most serious instances of attacks on education. So I think what we need is to renew our efforts to ensure that the open source data that we're celebrating that's going to be launched uh, this summer, which is the series Education Under Attack, has impact. It's used for multiple purposes, including public advocacy and for greater accountability. And just in closing, I wanted to say that at this time when the frequency, the duration and severity of conflict remains unacceptably high, I think this opportunity, this high level virtual event is a really important opportunity to come together, to work in collaboration, to ensure the provision continuation of education during conflict. So I thank all the organizers and I think this would be the start and carrying the momentum through to Nigeria next year for all of us to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very um, inspirational intervention and, and very substantive. But we need to be ambitious and the leadership shown by Nigeria for the African continent and everyone looking forward to joining you next year. Ambitious and moral leadership. Thank you so very much. Now, before we proceed to the opening up the, the floor, may I kind of ask all speakers to limit their statements to one minute. We are actually uh, over time, uh, in two minutes we will start running over time. So please, short statements, maximum one minute. And it's therefore now my great pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Getahun Mekuria Kuma, the Minister of Education from Ethiopia. Minister Kuma, we are delighted to have you with us. I hand over to you. Minister Kuma, are you with us? Have to see, are you with us? I don't see, I don't hear Minister Kuma. Anyone else does? Well, in that case, we may have to change the order and I'll proceed to the next person on the list. And should Minister Kuma appear, he will then be given the floor. So then I move on to Her Excellency Dr. Sima Bahus, who is the permanent ambassador and permanent representative uh, to the permanent mission of Jordan at the United Nations. Alan Gosalen, the floor is yours, um, Ambassador Bahus. Ahlan Yasmin, it's so good to see you and so good to see everyone, uh, despite the fact that we are all uh, under lockdown and uh, COVID-19. But uh, let me first thank you all uh, without mentioning names and with, uh, with all the protocols observed. I would like to thank all the distinguished organizers and the panelists for holding this timely meeting. Uh, dear friends, uh, the current pandemic has disrupted, as you all know, all aspects of our everyday life 
and has put pressure on our economies, on our societies, including on access to education. As my country, Jordan, undertook necessary measures to control COVID-19 and to protect the lives of Jordanians and refugees in Jordan, the government quickly activated e-learning platforms such as Dersak to help students across the country reconnect with their teachers and classmates to resume their education. Since the launch in March 2020, it has seen more than 35 million views of classes. And we believe that this is something important to continue to keep up and to protect even in such crises as uh, COVID-19 and other crises, of course. Distinguished uh, colleagues hosting millions of refugees uh, from Syria, from Palestine and others, other places in the region. Jordan, along with its international development and UN partners, continues to provide free quality education services to students affected by crisis who have uh, found refuge in Jordan. This commitment remains very strong while also seeking to ensure access and quality towards the vision of education for all, equity in the realms of both gender and special needs, improving enrollment rates, accommodating all age groups, providing a stimulating educational environment, and development, developing awareness and health programs. In this regard, we call for support to national and UN response plans, including for UNRWA's response plan to COVID-19 and other, so that we can ensure that all agencies can continue to provide access to education to both boys and girls in any situation of crisis. Dear friends, Jordan was among the very first countries to proudly endorse the Safe Schools Declaration in May 2015, Today, our commitment to protecting children from the horrors of armed conflict remains unwavering and will continue. Jordan was also among the main co-sponsors of the GA resolution entitled International Day to Protect Education from Attack, presented by Qatar. Education is the insurance that our children, both girls and boys, need so that they do not fall prey to poverty nor to the traps of dark ideologies of terrorism and extremism which uh, become more threatening in times of crisis. As we celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Safe Schools Declaration and the 75th anniversary of the United Nations amidst a global pandemic, we need to mobilize all efforts to promote a conducive environment to protect not only our children but also our teachers, our educators, our educa uh, education systems are safeguarding the future of children by continuing to provide education and unleashing the students' potential and their wide horizons. Distinguished colleagues, 70 years since the adoption of the Geneva Convention of 1949, Yet images of the inhumane attacks on bare unarmed civilians and children continue to haunt us, allowing the legitimacy of the principles of human rights to be attacked. Protection of human rights in times of peace is obligatory. It is protection of humans in times of war and conflict is super erogatory. Thus, it is crucial to continue to safeguard education for all, to promote the culture of peace and harmony, and to strengthen multilateral collective solidarity. It is our duty to uphold international law and international humanitarian law wherever and whenever humanity is threatened or violated, and to stand in the face of any aggression, any injustice, or violation of human rights. Finally, my friends, the challenges we face today are daunting. And as a result, education is under attack. We need to protect education from its con uh, conventional and unconventional enemies that threaten the future of our children and the promise of sustainable development and the achievement of all these development goals. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I took more than one minute. Sorry, Mesmin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Ambassador Barbouz. Uh, you took time, but you also spoke about important issues. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate this. Now we are moving on, and I'm going to stop commenting because I realize we're running out of time. So we we'll move on immediately to Her Excellency, Ms. Rabab Fatima, Ambassador uh, uh, to the, on the per to permanent mission to the United Nations of Bangladesh. Please, the, the, the floor you. is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. I thank you, Madam Moderator, for giving me the floor, and I thank the uh, 
uh, permanent missions of Norway, Argentina, Nigeria, Qatar, Spain, and Uruguay, and uh, for education cannot wait for organizing today's very timely and important event. I also thank the honorable ministers of Norway and Spain and the distinguished speakers, the panelists, for their extremely moving and profound presentations. When it comes to protecting education from attacks, the ongoing initiative to adopt a GA resolution is an important step forward. Uh, apart from providing education, schools and educational institutions have varied beneficial uses. For instance, during humanitarian emergencies and natural disasters, they provide shelter and refuge to thousands of people. During this pandemic, we are seeing their use as quarantine centers and makeshift hospitals. So educational institutions are critical infrastructures, yet, yet it is unfortunate that they are increasingly attacked or used as shields during conflict by terrorists or non-state actors. All parties in conflict should adhere to some sort of protocol or norms to ensure safety of and protection to educational institutions, religious schools, and places of worship. In and I, I, I believe, we believe that the international community has an important responsibility to make sure that this happens on the ground. Bangladesh engages in the discourses and initiatives concerning the use, safety, and protection of educational institutions in all situations. And we will continue to do that. As the current president of the UNICEF Executive Board, we are working with member states to facilitate relevant, various relevant programs of UNICEF to ensure that all educational institutions, students and staff are safe from violence and all kinds of attacks, including in conflict situation. I have two very brief questions uh, for the speakers. And um, my first question is that how can we ensure compliance from non-state actors in refraining from attacking places of education. And my second question is that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we see a race to adopt online learning. This also exposes educational institutions to cyber attacks. What can be done to prevent such attacks? I thank you again, all of you, for a wonderful program. Thank you very much. Ambassador to the permanent, the permanent nation of Bangladesh. Let me make a small correction here. Uh, yes, uh, a kind gentle. That today's event is organized by the Global Coalition uh, for the Protection Against um, from uh, from Attacks Against Education, Protecting Education from Attacks, together with Norway, Argentina, Nigeria, Qatar, Spain, and Uruguay. And education cannot wait. It's just um, a, a very close partner and are there for honor to be here, but they are not the main organizers. Um, thank you very, very much for that. We will move on, and I need to stress, we have one minute per speaker now, one minute. So we have to take our prepared statements and cut them into half and do that and improvise, um, but um, we have already run over time. Thank you for your understanding and mindfulness on that. I will now move on to His Excellency, Mr. D. Maxwell Sa Kamaye, uh, um, uh, the ambassador to the permanent mission of Liberia to the United Nations. The floor is yours, please. Uh, ambassador um, D. Maxwell Sa Kamaya, are you with us? No, you may not be with us right now, but should you come back, let us know. Then I will move further on the list. And the next is His Excellency, Mr. Mayor Margarian, who is the um, uh, ambassador and permanent representative of the Republic uh, of Armenia to the United Nations. Are you with us? Uh, Madam Moderator, Ambassador had to leave. I am DPR of the mission, David Gnezan. I would like to, at, at the outset, to thank Deputy Minister Hagen, Deputy Minister uh, Galah, and USG Gamba, as well as representatives of civil society and academia for outlining the complex challenges related to protection of education from attack. The crisis caused by the pandemic has had a devastating impact on all strata of our societies, including children and in particular their access to education. We fully endorse the call of the UN Secretary General to prioritize education for all children and put an emphasis on the most vulnerable, including children in conflict situations, as reflected in his message on the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on children. 
attempts to isolate people living in conflict areas from the outer world and denying their inalienable human rights, including the right to education, should be identified and effectively addressed. The fifth anniversary of the Safe School Declaration is an important momentum to renew our commitment to protection of the right to education of children affected by conflicts, in particular those residing in conflict areas as the most vulnerable. Armenia prioritizes protection of children's right to education as reflected in our national policies as well as in the framework of our international cooperation. We we'll closely work with the ICRC in creating shelters and safe rooms in schools and kindergartens located in the border regions and also undertake other measures to ensure safety of schools in line with the whole declaration. Armenia's commitment is also reflected in our co-sponsorship of the General Assembly Resolution on International Day to Protect Education from Attack. We support the efforts of the Special Representative in streamlining and integrating the activities of international community around the noble goal of protecting children and ensuring their inalienable right to education. Thank you once again for convening this meeting. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much um, for your intervention from the permanent representative of Armenia. Thank you so much. We will now uh, move on to His Excellency uh, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Martin Bille Herman from uh, the permanent mission of Denmark to the United Nations. Nice to see you again, Martin. Please. No, th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. Ministers, excellent colleagues and friends, all protocol observed. I want to start by recognizing my colleagues, especially from, uh, from, uh, from Jordan and Bangladesh, Sima and Rabab, for the amazing work that their countries are doing in actually providing education to children that are not only citizens of their own countries. I have three messages. No? Stop, start, sustain. Stop attacking innocent civilians, stop attacking the future, stop breaking international law, stop breaking promises. We know that access to education is crucial in ensuring a future for children. And yet many children in armed conflict lack access to education because of regular attacks on school. This must come to an end. That was the stop. Start doing what you said you would. The UN Security Council has identified attacks against school as a grave violation. Now, more than half of UN member states have now signed the Safe Schools Declaration, which Denmark signed uh, years ago. We are also a proud co-sponsor to the resolution to establish an international day to protect education from attack, so that we can ensure a strong, consistent focus on this extremely important topic. Now, what we must really start to put is to start to put words into practice and ensure action and accountability to future policies, as well as uh, resolutions. And finally, we must not only gather for a day, we must sustain a strong focus on education in crisis and conflict by providing long-term funding for education in emergencies. And I'm proud that Denmark, from the beginning, has been one of the largest donors to Education Canada Wait, reaching more than 1.5 million children in 2018 alone. We will sustain our efforts. Stop, start, sustain. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you so much, and thank you also on behalf of Education Canada Wait for your for your sustained support. But I think we all need to remember when we speak about the Safe School Declaration and our message to the world: stop committing violations, start implementing them, and, and sustain them so that we can create a better world. I think that's that's a, a, a beautiful slogan. Thank you very much for that. We move forward. Um, um, now I have the pleasure of inviting um, the Minister Councillor, Deputy Permanent Representative, Mr. René Alfonso Rudias Perez of the Permanent Mission of Chile to the United Nations. Please, are you with us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon, um, Excellency, colleagues, or protocol observe. Chile commands the permanent missions and the global coalition to protection education from attack the sponsors of this timely event as we commemorate the fifth anniversary of the Safe Schools Declaration during the current Protection of Civilians Week. We observe with concern that the schools continue to be used for military purposes, exposing teachers and students to attacks. As the Global Coalition report, facilities are burned, schools' equipment are destroyed, and trends against educational Education personnel continue. The military use of schools against international law affects not only the safety of children and teachers, but the fulfillment of the right of every child to education. 
The protracted nature of conflict is sadly taking a toll on guaranteeing equal access to education in accordance with, with SDG 4. A child's right to education cannot be safeguarded in conflict zone without education itself being protected. Our commitment to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all based on inclusive and equitable education must not the situations of conflict remain the exception. To leave no child behind, especially those who live in the midst of conflict, our action must be geared towards their educational, developmental, and psychological needs. Protecting educational settings is a key element of this agenda. Finally, succeeding at protecting schools against attacks involves commitment, cooperation, and proactiveness from all parties involved. We need to ensure adequate, timely, predictable, and flexible resources to address this critical challenge. Monitoring and reporting of attacks on education remain an important evaluation tool that fosters the efficiency of all efforts. This way, we are convinced we should move progressively closer to ensuring that education is a means to build peace rather than a collateral damage of conflict. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much for your intervention. And I will now move forward with speed to the next uh, speaker. Again, calling for one minute interventions, please. Our next speaker being Ambassador, Def uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative, uh, uh, Mr. Stefano Stefani uh, from the permanent and representing the permanent mission of Italy to the United Nations. Uh, please, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and I'll try to follow your directions and I'll try to navigate quickly through my That's notes. Uh, what I want to say is that I welcome this debate very much. I mean, it was uh, really interesting. It's important that during the, the week dedicated to the protection of civilians, we had this particular moment dedicated to the protection of education, uh, which is uh, also for us, like for the other colleagues, a fundamental component of humanitarian emergency interventions. Uh, let me say that at the 33rd conference of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, we presented a national and open pledge to ensure that children can live safely and can enjoy their rights even in conflict situations. And on the occasion of the fifth anniversary of the Safe Schools Declaration, we also want to welcome the fact that this important document has enjoyed so far a great number of endorsement, but obviously, as recalled by other speakers, I mean, implementation is really key to make a, a substantial progress. Um, reference was made also to accountability. Let me recall that the targeting of civilians, including, including students and teachers, in situations of armed conflict, as well as the attacks on civilian objects, such as schools, they are prohibited under international law. So these actions may constitute great breaches of the Geneva Conventions and could be prosecuted as war crimes under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. This is important to, to recall. Uh, let me also recall that during our latest mandate in the Security uh, Nation, in the Security Council of the UN in 2017, we engaged in keeping up the Council attention on this item, and we provided contribution to reinforce the language on this issue in all UN Security Council resolutions. We promoted a systematic inclusion of provisions on the protection of civilians in the mandates of peacekeeping operations. And this engagement of ours continue also in the General Assembly, and we have been particularly pleased to co-sponsor the draft resolution proposed by Qatar uh, to proclaim the International Day to protect education from uh, attacks, and we look forward to the positive conclusion later today of the relevant silence procedure. Uh, let me also recall that on the occasion of their 20th anniversary, it is important to promote greater awareness of the two optional protocols to the International Convention on the Rights of the Child. These are relevant documents also for the discussion that we are having today. And finally, uh, let, me, let me tell our colleague uh, Samson that we noted uh, duly his invitation and uh, we much appreciate the invitation to the conference. We will certainly be there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your intervention. And we will now move forward to the next. Mr. Uma Castaneda Solaris, Minister Council of the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of Guatemala to the United Nations. Please. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine, and thank you very much to the panelists and to everyone, all protocol observed. It's a great pleasure to see you, and thank you very much also for the information. Uh, also, I will follow your directions, trying to be brief. Certainly for Guatemala, uh, it is a great pleasure that we, after a long and extensive process of consultations in 2019, we endorsed the Declaration on Safe Schools. To date, we understand, as you have indicated, more than 100 countries uh, and states of the United Nations have expressed their political support, strong political support for the protection of every child, young student, teacher, schools, and universities during armed conflicts. And we urge in this context to all member states that have not done so to join and endorse also this declaration. Certainly, we are extremely concerned that uh, in this case, particularly, we're seeing or we're still seeing many attacks conducted by armed groups and a current increase of civilian casualties in armed conflicts. Children living in conflicts not only suffer the deprivation of their basic human rights and education, health, freedom from fear and torture, but this is extremely worrying when we see that uh, the right of life is particularly deprived from them. These are despicable acts that should be subject to strong condemnation, especially by the United Nations Security Council and of all member states. We certainly believe that also uh, in this 20th anniversary of the optional protocols to the Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, certainly we believe and we want to express our peaceful vocation, uh, at the same time expressing our strong condemnation against indiscriminate attacks and the recruitment of children by armed groups to serve as soldiers and worse still, to be, to be used as human shields in military confrontations. Only if we continue to act in a coherent manner, we will be able to fully comply with our responsibility to protect the most precious asset for the future of our societies, our children. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. We uh, then move on to the next speaker, um, um, uh, Mr. Mohammed uh, uh, Naimi, Minister, uh, Deputy Prom Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Afghanistan to the United Nations. Uh, please. Uh, the thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. I would be very brief. Let me thank in one word to all organizers and the moderator for organizing this very important meeting. Let me say three words as well. Children are our future. Education is a fundamental right of every child. Protection, education, and educational institutions are our main responsibility at national, regional, and global level. Uh, at the national level, conflict and security continue to threaten the life of every child in, uh, uh, to receive a quality education. As UNAMAB you know, in 2019 verified 70 incidents uh, uh, impact access to the education, including attacks targeting and threatened against education in education facilities and personnel. Large number of teachers, trainers, and students were killed, kidnapped in 2019. This is not acceptable. In total, nearly 1,000 schools remain in, inactive or close to, uh, secure, uh, to the security reason access of children to the education. Hundreds of thousands of children have no access to fundamental right, which is education. Attack on education, uh, education facilities have also clear gender effect. Girls' schools are most, almost 80% likely under attacks by terrorist uh, uh, groups and terrorist uh, people. At the, at the national level, the government working to improve education infrastructure and the rules of uh, uh, and and the, to resolve the threat and security posed by, uh, particularly to girls and women. At the end, just I would like to thanks to all those countries and international organizations helping Afghanistan and education uh, sector. Uh, 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 and just would like to add one thing education in Afghanistan from preliminary to higher education is the responsibility of the government. And Afghanistan is part of the declaration from May 2015. And I will stop it here.
Thank you very much. Um, uh, to the uh, uh, prominent representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations, uh, to Now we are going to move on and um, we are um, ending the interventions and concluding them, Afghanistan concluding the interventions from the, the, the permanent members of the United, the member states of the United Nations, permanent too, in, in, in the anyways. Uh, and we'll move over to um, colleagues and partners uh, in the United Nations system, and we have two of them with us. And it's my honor to introduce the first, Segolin Adam, who is the chief of the humanitarian policy section of the Office of the Emergency Program at, uh, at UNICEF. Uh, please, Segolin, you have one minute to say it all. Over to you. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, it's great to see you, and uh, it's very, um, uh, really brilliant to see so many, so many interventions uh, today. I want to thank uh, the the organizer for the event, and uh, um, UNICEF really applauds all the member states who have uh, and endorsed the Safe, De Safe School Declarations. This is a really significant achievement, but uh, as many have mentioned already, it's also only a first step. Uh, despite the endorsement of the declaration by 104 states, education remains very much under attack globally. The places that should be the safest for children in conflict-affected countries continue to be some of the most dangerous. Children are still dying in classrooms on their way to school, and schools are still being destroyed. And parents are still facing the impossible choice between sending their children to school or keeping them home uneducated but safe. Uh, I want to really thank the, Dr. Zaher for sharing your personal experience with all the pain and, and the hopes it carries. This gives us really insight to the plight of 250 million children who are living in conflict situation and what they are experiencing. So this is no time to rest. Now is the time for meaningful implementation of the declaration to translate our words into concrete change for children. And UNICEF is ready to work with the states to support their efforts to implement the declaration and with any parties really, really willing to uh, make a positive difference on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Segolin, and it's great to see you again. Thank you so much. Uh, we now move on to a second colleague at the UN, and that is Ms. Charleston Holmes, who is the senior coordinator um, at the sec for the section of education for migrant displacement and emergencies at UNESCO. I'm here. Good evening from France. Good to see you, Yasmin. I will cut it short because it's late for you. It's late for us here as well. Uh, as, as we now face a, a 1.2 billion students having their schooling interrupted by COVID, it reminds me how attacks against education are attacks against knowledge and the power it brings to transform lives to build futures. Um, as we celebrate the Safe School Declaration, uh, I just want to re recall what we are dealing with in terms of political processes, the important work of the SG's Office for Children in Armed Conflict, also the groundbreaking, groundbreaking engagement and commitment by Her Royal Highness the Sheikha Mosa to put protection of education from attack uh, on the agenda within UNESCO already in 2006. The political commitment we're seeing coalesce around the Safe Schools Declaration, launched in 2015 by Norway and Argentina, tells a story of a steady political engagement, providing a critical mass to move forward. There's a reflection of strong political unity and resolve to keep the momentum around one of the most extreme violations on the right to education. I thank you, Yasmin, for reminding uh, the importance of education uh, under attack report for the SDG4 and reporting on the indicator on, the, on, on attacks on education. Just finally, uh, remind that though attacks don't systematically make the, the, the headlines of the daily press, but they are stoking fear around education and stealing futures. I thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much for that, Shastin. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now going to go back and have two more speakers. One to, to go back to the Her Excellency, Ms. Arancha gonzalez Laya, the Foreign Minister of Spain, who would just like to say a few words and apologize that she ran late this event. Please, Your Excellency, uh, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Jasmine, and thank you for giving me briefly the floor before the conclusion of the meeting. I must apologize. I would have wanted to be with you at the beginning, but um, um, the statement on behalf of the Spain was delivered by Christina Galak. Uh, I only really wanted to make the point of addressing you myself uh, to underline Spain's commitment to this crucial issue, the protection of education from attack. Uh, Spain will continue working on the universalization of the Safer Schools Declaration and perhaps what's more important on its practical implementation. So count on us uh, to continue making this point, uh, especially a uh, message to Nigeria as uh, you take now the baton to host the fourth Safer Schools Conference. Uh, taking uh, this baton from Spain. Please count on us. We'll be very uh, glad to continue working with you on this. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all this good work that you do uh, collectively and look forward to remaining in touch. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you. We, uh, we're happy that you were able to make it and to see you at last, but not the least. Thanks. We now move on to the closing remarks. Uh, when the closing remarks by um, the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ms. Marianne Hagen. Please, um, uh, happy to see you again. Yes, Your Excellency, please. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank you all for your great engagement and for your patience. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers for sharing their experiences and the knowledge today. A special thanks to all the co-sponsoring um, partners of this event. And a great thanks to everyone who listened in for your questions that we didn't have the time to answer. I hope you got some of them answered during the discussions and uh, the comments that you have offered. I think that the Safe Schools Declaration is a critical tool for preventing and responding to attacks on education. Let's hope that the next time we meet, even more states will have endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration. Let's hope too that we will have even more good stories of successful implementation to share. I'm delighted by the news that Nigeria will host the next international conference on the Safe Schools Declarations. We believe that Nigeria, as one of the first group of 37 states to endorse the declaration, and as a strong advocate for an effective national implementation, is very well placed to take this word, work forward. Thanks to Nigeria's efforts, the African Union is now an active partner in promoting the declaration. I believe the conference, the first one on the African continent, will build on this momentum. Now, I thank you all for participating, and I'm looking forward to seeing many of you in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Now we'll, we'll close here. We have received questions. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in asking questions and having a debate. But since we have ran uh, over time already half an hour, you see the excitement and, and the interest in this discussion. Um, the organizers and, and, and GCPA, they will get back and respond via email to you. So all questions will be answered, but they will be answered um, uh, in a different form and shape through email. This is to let all of you leave now. Um, I, as the moderator, would just like to end with one final, one final sentence. Uh, we live in COVID times, and the good thing with COVID times is that it gives us a lot of time to reflect. And what has happened here today is that we're speaking about the values, our values. So I would like to end with a quote of Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, if we are going to move forward, that means building back better, we must go back and rediscover those precious values. And I think this is the time to rediscover them. And I think this discussion today um, has, uh, has inspired us to go back and be think about our values embodied in international humanitarian human rights law and refugee law uh, that has been coming out through the Safe Schools Declaration. It's been a very beautiful thing to moderate. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Minister Hagen. Thank you, all co-sponsors. Thank you, uh, the Global Coalition. Thank you all. Bye.